the guy that was a sound man for us for 20, like the first 20 years of Queens. His name is Hutch. When DOA won a Battle of the Bands on oh, a cool. PA, Joey Shithead was like, Hutch, you're the sound man now. And he turned you on to Stomping Tom? Amongst other things, yeah. I mean, cool, honestly, man. he was one of my sort of biggest musical influences. I remember the first time I heard Queens of the Stone Age. I was watching uh, Much Music, the music video channel in Canada. And I remember sitting on the carpet and, and watching the video for, for No One Knows and just feeling like, what what is this? I really like it. Is that okay? It feels kind of dangerous. In the decades that follow, Josh Homme and Queens of the Stone Age have gone on to become one of the most beloved touring acts anywhere. And in their new album, we're seeing Josh explore something a little bit more raw and a little bit more emotional. The band is about to start across Canada tour, ending in Halifax on April 17th. It's a great pleasure to welcome Josh Homme to Q. How are you? Thank you for having me. Thank you for that intro. I appreciate that. That is true, man. I remember that. I remember watching this and being like, am I being corrupted? <laughs> I, you know, I, I've often felt that corruption is one of my favorite activities. I think, you know, infiltration, corruption, when it's coming from the right place, it almost feels like the good cancer. It's almost eating from the inside out. And I don't know why. I think uh, I've always had a love of sort of corroding institutions, you know. So when you hear me say that, I felt sort of um, corrupted by it. You feel like that was sort of the point. I think it's the point not only for for you, but for me too. You know, I I think there's representations of all types of of desires in the arts, um, but I would love to be um, I would love to be the catalyst for a conversation where people are conspiring to do something outside of normal society. You know, I, I saw this quote and I was hoping you might help me understand it a little bit. You were talking about making this record and you said, um, if your roof is flooding, you don't say we should make a record about this. You have to stop yourself drowning in a flood. I, I, I know you started this record a few years ago and it was unfinished and you came back to it. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could tell me what the flood was. And what made you want to come back to the record? Um, I've had the luxury of playing music since I was, you know, nine. I had my first gig at, you know, 13. And it was at a party with, you know, 18-year-olds and 20-year-olds. And, and, uh, and, and all the difficult times being, a, like, I guess, a little kid and going through high school and all these like major transitions where a year is actually a big amount of emotional time, you know, um, my way of dealing with things that were difficult or sort of celebrating things that I truly loved was by playing music. So that's how I know how to sort of, um, unpack things that are big moments in my life, you know? And so, uh, this is kind of all I've ever known. <laughs> That's all I've ever known. And, um, and you know, that, that discussion about corruption, I think that's also something you, that was interested in really early on. You know, I think especially in the last three records or so, you, I've, I, I've sort of gotten to a spot where um, I, I'm not paddling upstream anymore because you realize this is your your stream of consciousness. It's this is your, dare I say, your journey, which is the word I'm a little bit over at the moment. <laughs> but uh, but it is it is your expedition, right? And so, what am I? Why would I paddle upstream on my own expedition? That's better to just drop the oar, and there's no one to revolt against. I'd rather experience this expedition and see how far it goes, rather than fighting upstream and going nowhere. You know, I. I so um, I think some of that desire for corruption and, and revolt um, has turned into um, seeing where this experience of being able to play music um, and sort of mine your own emotions and your own difficulties, where does that go? You know, well, at, like singing about things that are difficult or scary for you, you know? Um, I'd rather hear about that at this point in my life, you know. 
Is is that scary for you? I mean, not not to get into it too much, but you've you know, like you've gone through an awful lot in the past couple of years. Like I know you, you went through a, a divorce. Um, like a lot of your a lot of your friends have have died when I was doing research for this. Yeah. Like nine of them. Yeah, nine uh, of friends of yours have died. You 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 had uh, cancer. I think you're in the clear now. Mm-hmm. Um, I am. Yeah, I I I, but I I. I don't think I've ever grown as much in a short period of time, you know, and I, I, so I can't, I can't help but be sort of thankful for the whole thing, <laughs> you know? And also, um, I didn't sign in for, um, a quiet life. Uh, and, um, and I think the learning came from these things that occurred, even though, even when it's a death or, or and you say, Oh, I have, that was, that's not my fault. I, I still have a part in it. I could have done more, and and I, and and sometimes that's just in how you use your time, and how present you are. Am I now? Am I here now? You know, am I dragging the past along with me? Is it slowing me down? You know, and am 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 I thinking too much about the future, which is just playing you know a guessing game? You know, thinking about the future too much. Am I am I worried about that, or am I just here right now? I mean. We're talking, and basically, your whole life has led up to this moment, and here we are, and this is it. And so, I, 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 uh, I think all these things that have occurred have got me, in a lot of ways, where all the records and things that I've been able to be part of, those are chapters in a book that's closed. This is this new record is just the start of something else. I feel. It's not that I didn't appreciate it before. It's just I have a new appreciation, which I'm enjoying, you know. Now, when you say it's scary, is it scary when you're in front of the microphone? What what does what does it feel like in your body when it's when it's scary to sing about this stuff? Um, well, I mean, there are times when there are cer- there are certain songs that I have to be careful how much I focus into them. I have to sort of get my focus out towards the audience because it's it can be difficult to sing about things that are difficult (laughs) over and over. And something really personal, right? Over and over again. You start to relive that stuff, I guess. uh, Yeah, if I'm not careful, I sort of get sucked into that. And the funny thing is, is that these these songs are about emotions and experiences you have. And if you're not careful, you you accidentally get trapped in the gravity of those moments again. I'm sure that those performance, you know, my desire for live, for a performance to be different every night is so strong that it's almost about letting myself be pulled in the gravity of these different moments and, and being really present in the now so that tonight is different than yesterday is different than tomorrow, you know, but I, uh, but um, that can feel physically and sort of mentally risky, (laughs) too, you know, um, because I don't really care about my body and my mind up there and I, cause I don't, I don't want to control what's happening. I just want to be part of that moment that's happening, you know? And, uh, so we don't have a, a show in the, in terms of like a Broadway show that would follow a certain way of yeah. running order. You know? Yeah, yeah. Some 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 touring groups right now, and and uh, I'll I'll say no shade to them. They run the show more like you know. There's music cues and there's vocal cues, and it's it's a it's a show top to bottom. Yeah, I, 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 in fact, more and more and more and more and more and more people are are taking this route, even where you say the same things in between songs. And and um, I don't really have a thought on that at all. It's just that that's not what I do. That's not what I'm. That's not what I signed up for. Um, sometimes it's, you know, fragile and emotional and sometimes it's got, it's covered in blood and and I don't know which one it's going to be. And I, I like rolling dice like that because I feel like, um, uh, I feel like that the audience also, they first have to watch it and decide it's a bit like double Dutch when the the audience has to watch and decide when to jump in, get into this. And once they do, it's a major commitment. You know, it's not, you know, um, and I, but I, I like the investment of that. Uh, uh, and I do feel like that helps to turn an arena with 15,000 people 
into a secret meeting <laughs> too. That it can be like, you know, I often feel like um, that it's like our parents aren't here. And even though it's Tuesday, it feels like Saturday. I'll turn the lights out and um, we'll conspire, you know. What what shows were you going to that first gave you that feeling when you were when you, when you were a young person going to shows? Uh, you know, first time I saw Tia Sowell, it was brutal and terrifying. And and it was at a water park. <laughs> at know? a water park? Yeah, it was at the Palm Springs water park and it was the dichotomy of see of going to a place of of joy by day and at night um it was so unpredictable and I, and I grew up playing that way so we would take a generator into the desert and play and there, so there's no in order to get away from the police busting up house parties and things like that and so you don't realize at first that when you are away from the police and any adult authority as a teenager what you're doing is lawless and and is out of control and some nights that's magical and other nights that's it's terrifying I was just and, about to ask, what, what's the scariest part of that? I think the scariest part is that I grew up in a world where physical violence was completely normal. Really? And, you know, where, where it was so commonplace that the fight would break out and people would put their arms out and say, back up, let them finish. Which if you really think about what that means, it's just, it's a terrifying way to, um, to spend a Friday and then the Saturday, the next day. And then, you know, and, and also I think it sort of gives you an un- incorrect vision of what being a man is too, that, that there's a brutality attached to it. I do think there is a brutality attached to being a man, but I don't think it should be at the forefront of how you <laughs> identify yourself as a man, you know? And uh, so I think Queens and, and uh, Caius and, that world was was um, really um, unpredictable, and um, and so um, you know I think by today's standard it would be downright illegal and outrageous, you know. But I but I growing up and watching going to see the Dwarves play. I don't know if you know the punk rock band the Dwarves. Yeah. Or going to see going to see Iggy or the Cramps. Or you just don't understand what's going to happen, you know. And um, I liked that uh, growing up listening to the Doors. You know, it was the first time I recall being scared by rock and roll music, um, where where it's painting a picture where you're where you feel uncomfortable, and and, and a sense of eeriness surrounding you. I, I I love all that imagery. It's it's it feels like an important part. How can you? You can't just say you love someone all the time. And you can't just say you're angry all the time. There's, there's also the sort of magic of saying, "I don't know what's out there. Yeah. I don't know what's, I don't know what's in the woods." You know, uh, but I think it's just as valuable. Well, I'm, I'm really seeing that, on, and, and that helps me understand what we've been talking about up to this point really well. You know, that like there's a certain kind of uncertainty that comes with these sort of like legendary generator parties that you did, or going to see a, a punk band at a, at a water park and they're being fighting. There's another kind of uncertainty that comes with like I got to sing about some hard stuff I've gone through. I got to, I got to, I got to follow some some uh, sadness I've I've gone through. I got to follow some doubt I've gone through. But when you were talking to me about when you were growing up, you found that sort of. Um, you you found that lawlessness and recklessness out of these out of these parties. When I read reviews or when I read not reviews but like comments around Queens of the Stone Age music, a lot of the stuff I see is like I turn to Queens of the Stone Age when I'm going through my hardest times. I was actually kind of struck by how much of that I saw when I was looking for like you know audience response to this new record. What about yeah. you? What what where did you turn to when things were tough? Well, I think, you know, if we're talking, you know, before we're just talking about origins, where, where it begins, I think quickly you learn that that um, problems can't be solved just by getting fucked up. They can't be solved by simply fighting your way out, physically fighting. And, and um, they need to be solved with a gentle hand and by listening and by being having this sort of courage to be the first person to put your hand up and say like, Oh, that was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I just, and, and, you know, also as the time goes on, I, I, 
the the necessity um th there's new types of volatility and they're more emotional and they're like how do i everyone's going to go through difficulties but how do i go th through them where i'm okay i can sleep at night you know and 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 you know and in dealing with loss because i never you know we've won a few things but i never learned anything when we won something it, it, it never ended up mattering to me that much it's sort of like getting knocked down and standing up with, with self-respect that's more interesting to me and so i think as the years have gone on our our fans they they've been through stuff too you know and um and also there's all these young kids who have the same sort of beginning that is volatile that i had they immediately are stepping in ahead of where i started <laughs> You know, I started as a complete bonehead. That's just, that was all I knew. And so um, I think I meet a lot of people that were like this, you know, this record or like Clockwork or some of these other records that got, they got me through a dark time. And I'm, I, my answer is always like, me too, you know? And I, I do think that our fans understand that the reality of what we're doing you know i that's all i care about at this point is that it feels honest because i have nothing else to give i mean i, I don't have hobbies i don't i'm not a woodworker i don't wrench on engines i don't you know what i mean i mean this is this is what i have to give and so i i i think that it resonates with the fact that i've gone through hard times you go through hard times we go through hard times but Queen's still at the end of the day, and especially live is a celebration of that. I'm not dead yet. Not yet. And and that seems like so elemental and important to me. It's like, you almost killed me. It's like, yeah, but you ain't dead yet. You know, what do you want to do with the time you have left? You know, who wants to go miniature golfing? I'm ready. You know? That, I mean, that sort of weirdly leads me to something that I wanted wanted to talk to you about in a sort of a strange way, which was that I saw the video of you performing at Taylor Hawkins. Um, uh, so Taylor Hawkins, for people who don't know, the drummer for Foo Fighters, for Canadians especially, the drummer on Jack a Little Pill. Um, <gasps> I mean, you know, it's a big deal here in Canada. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, and a good friend of yours. And I watched the, um, I watched some of the tribute concert, you know, just people putting up, people putting up videos. And you want to talk about like, how we go through hard times. Well, one of the ways that we go through hard times is to all come collectively together and celebrate. And what I was struck by was that it wasn't a maudlin song I saw you perform. Mm -hmm. You did Let's Dance by <laughs> Bowie with Nile yeah. Rodgers on guitar. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Why, why that song? You know, I think one of my dearest friends, Dave Grolf, uh, you know, um, he was really, he was trying to put together a concert that Taylor could hear from wherever he is, <laughs> you know, something that Taylor would have loved, right? And he just did a really, that was a Viking funeral from, <laughs> if I've ever seen one, you know? And, um, you know, I think when you, you know, for anyone that's lost, so important or and then if you live in a time where it's multiple people you start having to deal head on with you know just questions of like can't i can still love somebody even when they're not here and so i think dave just did a really he did um a job that maybe only he could do and so he was talking to me about wanting it to be a celebration and that's something taylor would have wanted to be at and taylor wouldn't have wanted to be at like oh some maudlin, you know, situation. Um, and so he just threw Let's Dance at me. And I was like, of course, you know, uh, uh, absolutely. And uh, and what's funny is that walking out there, uh, that's all I could think of is that's what I want to do. <laughs> you know, I just want to, there's something about, uh, there's something about taking in the moment that almost makes me want to move a little slower, you know, and a little more deliberate and just sort of like, 
you know, I, I, I really, I was thankful for that moment because the sentiment of that song is, is, uh, man, anytime that song comes on, anyone with half a brain goes, fuck yeah. Thank God this is on. I guess I was wondering what it was like to be at this sort of, um, massive Viking funeral, as you call it, for your friend while you were dealing with your own sort of diagnosis, while you were dealing with a lot of other loss in your life? Uh, it was, um, at that point, I was still staring down the barrel of not knowing what was going to happen, you know, so I was, uh, you know, as I said, I think I the biggest takeaway and the thing I'm most thankful for is like an appreciation of the moment you know and and taking moments out of the stealing them out of the sky and just making them yours and 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 by making them yours I just mean feeling like I'm part of this you know so that unbeknownst to this crowd of like 60,000 people yeah backstage it was so familiar you know like a, a family affair and and so it felt so small but it's like a hundred people it's like a hundred different artists and and uh you know there's a lot of people locked arms and sort of celebrating the the chance to say goodbye together i mean that was the moment i really felt like i said goodbye yeah was was uh so i i, I really it's an unforgettable moment. And at the end of the day, I'm just trying to like string unforgettable moments together, like popcorn around the Christmas tree here, you know? Yeah. Um, so have, have you come out of this with, and I, 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 I've sort of been dancing around this, I guess, since you started talking at the very beginning, have, have you, you don't strike me as a particularly spiritual man, you know, just knowing what I, what I know of your, of your music, but I realize there's nothing to be gleaned from that at all. Has, has this uh, experience given you a new insight into some sort of spirituality? It kind of sounds like it. Well, I, I, I've, I've always had a connection. I was, you know, raised with the Bible being pounded into me and, and uh, but I've always been, I've always been, uh, I think it was my, a, a natural, um, igniter for revolt, you know, um, because I think the, one of the most, the first most important things to do is start asking questions and actually listening for answers. Um, but there are some questions that simply can't be answered because my fragile, feeble mind is not equipped to understand certain things. And I'm okay with that too. And so I think the word spirituality is so nebulous, but it just suggests looking for some connection beyond your own understanding. And if that is the definition, um, then I've always been on the search for spirituality, looking for meaning um, uh, and, and knowing that the world is actually filled with magic is filled with things I could not understand, filled with enigmas, things that don't make sense, yet here they are in existence anyways. And, and you know, in a time when most people are just looking down at their screens, um, remembering to just take a moment to look up for a second, you know. And, and I, so I, and music has always been my way to say those things, you know. Like I, I'm not a poet, but I do write poetry and, and play guitar for a living. I'm I'm one fire away from kumbaya, <laughs> but I'm proud of that. I love that search, and and that um, that makes me feel good, not bad, you know. Um, yeah, because I, I I think part of feeling spiritual under that definition is just that you're chasing the things you love and not worried about what, what other people say or what other people think about, you know, your interests. I don't have guilty pleasures because I just don't feel bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I want to shift lanes just a little bit here and talk about uh, guitar playing for a second. You know, there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of like articles and stuff online about your guitar playing. A lot of people studying your guitar playing. <laughs> uh, one thing that keeps on coming up sort of just a general way is that Josh Homme's Earlier, earliest guitar teacher taught him polka, and that's the reason that he plays guitar that's the way that he does. But as someone who's actually listened to a little bit of polka, I'd like to dig into that a little bit. How, how did that happen? 
what kind of stuff were you being taught? Were you asking for roll out the barrel or were you asking for stairway to heaven? I was asking for heroin to Steven. I, 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 <laughs> I, I think if you were to just take Noah knows. Boom, chap, boom, chap, boom, chap, boom, chap. Do we have it? Can we just listen to a little bit of it? Oh, yeah. Boom, chap, boom, chap, boom, chap. So talk me through how polka shows up in that. Well, that is straight out of a polka playbook as if it were in a beer hall in Germany somewhere. And, and, um, and unintentionally, I mean, it's sort of ref in reflection, have realized how that permeates so much of what I've done. And playing the other side of that instead of boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, but going, but going, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, ba, boom, which I, which I have found myself doing at many times and realizing this sort of the obladi, oblada nature of that too, where you're turning around beats because I'm a frustrated drummer. So beats are everything to me, you know, and I, I, um, but I also think the recipe, Caius was so singularly focused on a single idea. Um, and I just thought with Queens, why can't it be a little bit of everything done and juxtaposed in a, in a strange way? I don't scream and I never had any designs or desire to scream. I was saying, and, and frankly, more sort of softly than anything else. And so the notion, especially in the beginning, of heaviness juxtaposed by fragility, polka surrounded in uh, hip shake, turned polka like transformed into hip shaking. You know? Yeah. I, I I love to go dancing. I still do, and so it's like wanting something that's heavy in subject matter, potentially heavy in in its you know volume but that you could dance to that you could, you know, having wildly erratic expectations of the music in total, you know, and believing that it's possible, you know, um, not only believing it's possible, it's just being like, no, I know that's possible. And, and also like, you know, I think sometimes, you know, a comment people make is that we, we just sound different to other bands. Yeah. And I think, but isn't that the minimum obligation? If you if you're blessed enough to do this for a living, shouldn't you sound more like something unto yourself than sounding like everyone else? Yeah. I mean, I, that feels like I always felt that that was strange that you should sound different. You know, I mean, if if nothing else, playing music is the amplification of the part of you that is different. You know. Um, and, you know, even if it's folk music and not, if it's not amplified music, it's still amplifying that part of you mm -hmm. that's different. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's always been probably the most important part to me is that it would sound different. You know, like I'm surprised that that was a song that did so well because doing so well was never really that important, you know just sounding different, being different, existing in a different space, you know, um, that's more important to me. I think, I think that's the corrupting nature. I think when I watched that, there was sort of this feeling of, you know, when you walk into a haunted house, you think, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen a, a room like this before. And then you start, then you start hearing no one knows and you go, I've never really heard a song like this before. This is scary. Did that, did that guitar teacher you had who taught you polka ever hear no one knows? Did he ever get in touch or anything about it? You know, his name was Tom Polanski, um, which is utterly polka-ish of a name. Very much so. And, you know, I took guitar lessons from nine years old till about 11. And I never learned any bar chords. I never, all I learned was boom, 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 da, you know, this, that, that. And <laughs> I think in the time I was really frustrated by it. And so it drove me to either give up guitar or start writing music. So at nine years old, I was 10 years old, I was... You know, I was always hearing sounds in my head. You know, you're walking down the street and that's out of rhythm. And so I think I was always singing along to my own soundtrack. And 
you know, that's why I wanted to play guitar, you know, uh, was to get it out. Your options were limited. You were, you you didn't have an expressive vocabulary in your guitar playing. You had to create your own because your guitar teaching, your guitar teacher had taught you such a regimented style. Yeah. And it was such a narrow outlook of what guitar playing was. Yeah. And, and so it rendered me sort of like, um, where I understood this discipline, but, um, I had no formal training in in real life for like, I never learned a bar chord in two years. I'm still just kind of bopping through stuff. And, 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 uh, so I just sort of taught myself from there. And what was beautiful is coming from such a rigid, I, I see now coming from such a rigid, um, you know, set of rules that when left to my own devices, I was like, fine, I'll have none of that. There is no rules. There must be no rules. Uh, I will, I will sort of amble through the fog and find my own things. And I, I think that's why, as a guitar player, there are huge swaths of guitar playing that are blind spots that I know nothing about. But I can play you something that makes sense, but is strange, <laughs> you know, that is ultimately off kilter a bit. And um, and, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, I'm okay with, you know. It's funny because I, I suppose I could learn. I could learn about these blind spots I have, but I look at them as um, I look at those blind spots as like uh, a wonderful blessing. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, like you find your way anyway. Yeah, if you want to find your way. Yeah, you and know? and and it brings back to that idea of like the the beginner's mind, and if we approach everything as if we don't, or if if that, that if that. If that um, painting has not already been painted for us and it's blank for us, what can we actually get to do? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I almost don't always feel so great about my responsibility, in it, but the concept of detuning, right? So, and Caius, one of the reasons that I wanted to detune is because I wanted something that was mine. And there was no example of tuning down to B and C in standard tuning. There was yeah. no such thing. I think... Maybe Black Sabbath was tuning some songs in D, but I'd never heard them before. I was just a kid in the desert with a very small record collection. And I was like, I wonder if you if you just do this, what happens? Yeah. I didn't, you know, if I'd had a guitar teacher, the first thing that would have told me is that's not allowed. You yeah. Know? You can't, but it is allowed. It's allowed because that's what I want to do. And, and because, because this simply can do it. So everything is allowed, you know? And... And it became such a thing that now there's like seven string guitars with bees on them, you know? Yeah. yeah. And there's, it, it, it sort of gave way to a, a lot of heavy metal, some of which I, I like and much of which I don't, but that doesn't really matter if I like it or not. It, it, it sort of opened the doorway to like this thought that going, whoa, 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 whoa. And so I started playing out of bass amps and these things. I wouldn't have had the chance to find who I am and do the right thing the wrong way. If I, if I, uh, you know, um, if I hadn't had that beginning from Polka, you know, like, I love that so much. Yeah. And, you know, Queen still is detuned much of the time because it sounds unlike other things. Yeah. I love that. And, and, you know, what no one knows you're hearing a song that's tuned in C standard, like, you know, and, and so, it's a pop song and dropped to the, you know, yeah. you know, or became a pop song, it, uh, strangely. With you know. very loose, loose strings. Okay, let, let me close. Let me close off this way. We've talked a little bit about like how the act of making art and like the act of performance and like the act of like getting up on stage, whether it's be at Queen shows or at that Taylor show we were talking about, was like really helpful to you to like get through some hard times that you were going through and sort of really make you realize the. You know, uh, that all that sort of matters is that moment that you can present on stage and then the future is an illusion and the past is, is nothing but a memory. It doesn't really exist either, you know, and you're just trying to collect this, like you said, like popcorn string of, of beautiful moments and you're, and you're collecting them with your, with, your, with your shows. But what about the act of touring? I mean, you've been on the road since you were a kid, minus, um, minus the pandemic. How has, like, being with the band falling into the old rhythms of touring, the structure of your day when you're touring. How has that helped you process all, all of this as well? 
I mean, that's actually what makes it more difficult because really, uh, you know, essentially touring is, is, uh, if you just took everyone that you really truly loved and wanted to be around and then you just put them here and you said, okay, see you, I'm going to go play to people I don't know or essentially strangers. I'm going to put my life in their hands sort of, you know, uh, um, it's, it can be challenging to, um, and, and I think, um, you know, uh, we've been so blessed to do so well, and, which is always a shock to me, you know, be, um, that, but that doing well, that success can turn you into a bitter old crank and that sucks, you know, and that's not what I want. It's like, I, so it puts so much importance on the shows for me that they have to be different. They have to be just for tonight and they have to feel real to me. You know, I can't tell you how many times someone has, I've felt that it wasn't a good show. And someone says, wow, it was great. And it's like stabbing me in the chest. I'm like, don't say another word. I don't want to, you know, because I, so it puts a lot of importance for me that the show is something that I can be, that I wanted, I feel proud to be part of. And that it's, um, you know, I guess I want it really bad, you know, because there's a major sacrifice to yeah. do it. You know? Josh, I'm so excited people are going to get to see these shows. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You got it. Stomp and Tom. Mm-hmm.